Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Quint webinar session. It is called Behavior is the Fuel for True Change Towards DevOps. My name is Alexander Mazurk with Quint Wellington Redwood, and I'll be your host during today's session. Just a few things before we hop right in. Uh, that's me over on the, on the left and also our presenter, Dave. Uh, all I want to cover is that uh, it's fairly straightforward. All the audio today is being transmitted by a computer and you are all muted. So obviously you can hear us, um, but uh, we cannot hear you. Um, but to make yourselves heard, go ahead and use the questions pane. It should be on the right side of your GoToWebinar screen. Um, go ahead and ask a question if you have any at any portion of the presentation. We'll have a designated session at the end, in which I will read questions aloud. And our presenter today, Dave, will answer them for all to here. And last off, we are recording today's session. So even if you need to leave early, um, all registrants will be sent a uh, follow-up email with a link to view the webinar in its uh, entirety later on. Now, just a few uh, fun things about Quint, just uh, right before I hand things over to Dave. Um, we are one of the founding members of DASA, which is the DevOps Agile Skills Association, uh, which is a governing body um, over uh, some DevOps training, so DevOps fundamentals, practitioner, and uh, helping organizations organize themselves with DevOps. Similarly, we're also a founding member of the Lean IT Association um, as well. Um, we've been in the market for over 25 years. Uh, we started off in 1992. And uh, uh, a really nice thing is that uh, in addition to being a consulting company and sharing our thought leadership, we're also a training company. And uh, we've trained over uh, 30,000 professionals um, every single year from everything from um, you know DevOps to Lean IT, uh, even to uh, more uh, traditional methodologies, um, such as uh, IDLE, for instance. So. Um, Last, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our presenter today. Uh, he's an expert here at DevOps and Agile. Um, his name is Dan, Dave Van Herpen. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dave. Thanks, Alex, and uh, welcome, everyone. Yeah, and indeed, my name is Dave Van Herpen, um, and I am a consultant in uh, the Netherlands. And what I've done in the past years is help organizations to transform towards a new way of working. And uh, using particular methodologies like DevOps, Lean, Agile, and, uh, and all this stuff. Um, and I've been involved in uh, transformations regarding management teams, but also teams themselves, uh, training them, coaching them, and advising them. And what I'd like to do to you uh, with you today is to share some of my experiences around DevOps and DevOps transformations, and particularly zoom in on the aspect of behavior. Because in my experience, um, it is not only a matter of uh, defining that DevOps is a culture, is a mindset, etc., but it has to go a few levels deeper. And you have to be able to really make the behavior in your organization more tangible and the results, the, the desired results of that behavior more tangible in order to make the true transformation a success. So I'll dive into DevOps a bit in first, and then I will zoom into behavior and then see um, how they come together. So first in discussing what DevOps really is like, I'd like to use this metaphor. And this metaphor is about one airspace and it is shared by, in this case, two airplanes. And you could look at these two, like you know the change part of your enterprise and the continuity part of your enterprise or development and operations and they both share the same airspace but in practice you know in a lot of cases they diverge because you know from a development standpoint we use other frameworks and other systems where we put our findings in than we use at the operations part we have different behaviors and different competences in both worlds um, and this leads to divergent behavior which is also encouraged by having different kpis so people from development are usually steered on different KPIs than people from operations. And this leads to this kind of divergent behavior or to you know, clashes in real time. So if you move a, an application to production and there hasn't been a lot of collaboration in between, then you will this will result immediately in, uh, in, in, in crashes like this. So the real objective of working in a DevOps way is to have agility in the airspace as presented here, but to do it in parallel with all of the uh, parties that are involved in delivering value towards customers. So uh, one of these airplanes will be development and the other one will be operations, as in IT operations, but you know, uh, it's also about security and it's also about architecture. It's also about suppliers, about the business. 
It's also about management. So all of those roles that have a certain uh, role in the eventual delivery of value, they all should be collaborating in a dynamic, flexible way in order to achieve this end-to-end -end agility. And this is the true meaning of, uh, of DevOps. Now, what it really brings DevOps is uh, a, a, number of, a number of objectives. So first one, it brings happier people, as in happier customers, for instance. Whereas, you know, an agile way of working already brings happier customers, of course, because you involve them a lot more. Um, but if you only deliver a product until it's in production, and as soon as it's in production, you have, a, you have an operations process where people will have to file in a request which goes through a rigid change process, or if there are any incidents or disturbances that you'd like to report, yeah, you're dealing with some very rigid frameworks or processes. It, it doesn't make the customer a lot happier. So you really want that the agility will be sensed uh, by the customer throughout the entire life cycle of your product. And that will result in happier customers. It will also result in happier employees. Because a lot of frustration happens if a developer um, has to bring something to production, but has to wait, wait six weeks until you know his code is being put in production. And on the other end, if someone for operations is being thrown a lot of stuff like code on the, over the wall uh, without documentation, it doesn't make a lot of happier employees as well. So, you know, having a um, a collaboration mechanism such as DevOps um, brings, brings also happier employees. Now, the second one is, is to create a better quality for your products and services. Um, and, you know, one of the top items that we see in the annual State of DevOps report that are from Dora and, uh, and Pub Labs, and we see that, uh, that Usually, high-performance organizations lead uh, lead into about five times a lower change failure rate than low-performance organizations, and that means that the quality of whatever you're changing in your environments is uh, the, the quality is increasing uh, uh, dramatically. Okay? You get closer and better feedback loops, and this enables you to increase the quality of your products and services. Of course, DevOps is also about being faster, having a delivery pipeline which enables fast and automated delivery of your products into production. This, in the end, will deliver um, the end products and the features uh, to your customers in a faster way. And last but not least, it does not only involve happier people, better products in a faster way, it also has to be done in a smart way. So if you now have silos in your organizations with uh, people who strictly do design, then people who do some builds, people who do testing, and people who do operations, it is a lot smarter. Um, and also in optimizing all of, all of those uh, different elements, it is a lot smarter to combine those silos and to make multidisciplinary end-to-end -end teams that create true value for your customer. And if you do some optimization, you don't optimize within your own, let's say, build silo, which might be at the cost of someone in testing. Now you optimize for your team, which leads to more and better products for your, for your customers. Now, if, if we talk about DevOps, we need to make sure that we're talking about the same scope here. Because if I uh, if you ask 10 people what their definition is of DevOps, you get 20 different answers. 20 different answers. Um, to me, DevOps is uh, first and most of all, it should be business value driven, where it represents a, a delivery process, which is significantly end to end. So it all starts with this light bulb here, which is an ID. And this ID will come from the business, in some cases from users or consumers or customers, uh, or in some cases, those IDs might come from IT as well. Uh, but anyway, it starts with an ID. And the ID will have to be worked out a bit. So what exactly is meant by this? And that usually results in a backlog. And the backlog then is being developed by a team, could be a scrum team or something like that. And then it's being put into production. 
And the moment it's being put into production, at that point in time and no earlier, it will deliver value. So the crucial part here is, if you're only talking about, let's, let's say for instance, the first part. So from ID to the backlog, this is something that movements like Lead Startup cover, where you don't have a backlog yet, but you're already thinking about some hypothesis and you want to test and validate them already with your target audience. So in, in, in this part, Lean Startup type of principles will help. And then moving from the backlog to having something developed, and method methodologies like Scrum really help to do that in an iterative and incremental way. And then you might say that you now moving from something which is developed towards something that's in production, that that's DevOps, but actually that's, that's just DevOps light. So looking at the true essence of DevOps, um, we're not only talking about getting stuff to production in a fast way, we're looking at this entire value chain as you see it right here. So from ID to value, that is the true essence of DevOps. And this is also why a lot of companies have started to use term like biz, biz DevOps or um, biz dev sec ops or whatever, trying to get everything into one, uh, one term. I don't think that's really necessary. Just use a term that really represents a new way of collaboration like DevOps does. And let's all have a common understanding that uh, you should not only focus on development and operations, but also look at what happens before, what happens after, and what happens all around those teams. Now, um, in determining what DevOps really is, um, you also immediately have discussions around, so how does this relate to things like Agile, Lean, etc.? I always represent this in the way of this, uh, this Venn diagram that you see right here, um, where, for instance, DevOps and Agile have quite some overlap. And um, what, what you see in a lot of organizations, they have experimented with Agile ways of working, like Scrum, for quite some time. Um, and then DevOps is actually a sort of a logical evolution because they find out that the agile ways of working are not, you know, just um, do not only deliver value within the software development part, but also whatever happens before and after, you know, uh, there's a lot of value as well to, uh, to look at that from and to look at the agile values and principles from a total end to end life cycle perspective. So once you're in production, you still want agility. Um, and that's what a lot of companies realize once they have gone on the agile boat that DevOps is sort of a logical evolution to create more agility end to end. Um, still, it's drawn as a Venn diagram. So if you're not you know, into agile, scrum, um, XP type of methodologies, um, still you can have a lot of benefit in, um, in using DevOps principles and collaborating in a better way, but won't be, you know, the accelerator that you would like to have. So that's why Agile and DevOps usually go hand in hand. The same actually goes for Lean. So if you look at uh, the uh, DevOps fundamentals and the three ways, for instance, that we have defined in DevOps way of working, uh, a lot of them have to do with systems thinking, have to do with value streams, have to do with the voice of the customer and continuous improvement like Kaizen. So, you know, the whole fundamental methodology behind DevOps uh, results from lean practices in, uh, for a large share. DevOps also has a lot of uh, to do with uh, design thinking, uh, as in building in as much as possible, trying to involve you now people from security operations, but also customers who should be using, in the end, who should be using the product, but also people who should be maintaining the product um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an early stage as possible. And that's where design thinking uh, relates to DevOps way of working. Um, still, we have a lot of IT service management type of things that we do in DevOps environments, but maybe just in another way. We still have incidents, but we might solve them in slightly a different way than uh, maybe we have defined in the ITIL process, uh, ITIL process guides. Um, and maybe we still have a change process, but maybe we don't use a change advisory board, but probably have automated a lot of those steps in between. So we still see a lot of ITSM 
um, methodologies and frameworks like ITIL still be see, see them being used in DevOps, but slightly altered in, uh, in a lot of cases. Now, there is also a lot of overlap with cloud, of course. So if you want to move towards a DevOps way of working, having cloud technology help you to provision your environments in a faster way, but maybe also change your architecture towards a microservice architecture, um, moving away from large monolithic applications, with, which take forever in, uh, in testing and reg do, doing a regression testing. You now, cloud really helps you to catalyze that process. And last but not least, the automation part of DevOps, as in continuous integration and continuous delivery, is a very fundamental part of the DevOps way of working. And it ensures that whatever you are doing from code, from the moment you start working on it until the moment it's in production and you're monitoring it, whatever happens in between, and you want to automate it as much as possible, bring it under version control, etc. So DevOps at itself may not be um, strictly a new thing if you look at you know um, getting the whole life cycle in one team or even in one person if, if I talk to maybe like COBOL engineers COBOL developers who've been doing COBOL development for 40 years and I explain to them what DevOps principles are all about they'll say well I've been doing this for 40 years because you know 20 30 40 years ago I was already you know, uh, designing, building, testing, and operating my own stuff. Uh, but the thing that has really changed, and that's why it's called a perfect storm, is that all of these themes, movements, methodologies, now all create some kind of perfect storm where we find it normal to have autonomous teams, where we find it normal to have cloud uh, technology present and all of that stuff. So it's, it's just the momentum that's creating the whole DevOps. Uh, DevOps is uh, based on uh, the comms pillars. This is a worldwide being seen as the five pillars to balance if you want to create a transformation um, towards a DevOps way of working, um, which means that each one of these elements, culture, automation, lean, agile, measurement, sharing, have to be in balance with each, with each other. So only focusing your DevOps uh, transformation on getting your automation in place, getting some tooling in, making sure you have a, a great delivery pipeline, uh, bringing in the cloud, um, it only fixes a part of the a, a part of the whole you know the the whole DevOps context. So you also need to think about how our process is running and. What kind of you know, mindset methodology do we have behind this? What kind of leadership do we need for this? What kind of sharing do we need between people and between teams? Uh, and of course, how do we measure how we're performing? Because as long as we're not measuring how we're performing, how do we know where to improve? So having a DevOps transformation really involves a good balance in all of these five comms pillars. Now, what I'll do for the rest of this seminar is focus on the left part, focus on the culture part, because that's most, to me, that's most fundamental to, to, to any DevOps uh, transformation and maybe also the most difficult one. Uh, if we zoom into culture uh, and if we look at what DevOps could bring to an organization, I'd like to use this, um, uh, this, this framework that uh, Ron Westrum created with um, dip uh, different typologies of organizations, moving from pathological organizations who are oriented on power uh, with low cooperation and where novelty is not being treated as something great, um, towards bureaucratic organizations uh, where you have rules in place who organize everything, moving towards a generative organization which focuses on performance, where cooperation is being nurtured and where failure usually leads to collaboration and inquiry. Now, uh, this is all about you know, cultural stuff and how do we get there? What could be good predictions in order to create a culture like this? So a generative culture like this. Now, Westrom also invented some, uh, some triggers that in the end uh, relate to a certain organizational culture around DevOps. 
First, he said, well, if you look at job satisfaction, that's a pretty good predictor of what your organizational culture is, will be like. So how happy are people in their jobs? And in, this ter in, 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 in that turn, um, the effectiveness of how we process our information and how people actually like the way that we are able in the organization to process our information, in the end, is a good predictor of job satisfaction. So the more we focus on getting the information processing in our company up to speed you know, and having a certain standard in that, in the end, will result in a certain, um, certain organizational culture as the input here on the right. So if we want to make culture a bit more visible and tangible, we should do this along uh, the axis of behavior. And behavior is something that really makes culture visible and tangible in your organization. And my experience is that if you do not succeed in you know, creating discussions and ha having a really sound, you know, um, uh, we, uh, I'll do this again as well. Um, so let me see, I'll start over right now. Okay, so if you're making culture more visible, uh, we do this through means of behavior. And behavior is actually something that really makes culture really tangible. It makes it visible. And uh, actual culture is more of a joint set of all the behaviors in your enterprise. So all of the behaviors of people in teams, but also people in management, um, people in the business, people in IT, et cetera. So everyone in the enterprise has to show a certain behavior and all joined, uh, we call that a culture. And if you really want to change the culture, you have to look at behavior and be able to really change the individual and team behavior itself. Now, how do you do this? How do you change this behavior? There's a lot of different methodologies that you could use. I personally have quite some good experiences in using organizational behavior management methodologies behind this. Um, it is based on a scientific approach around uh, behavioral analysis, and it is mostly aimed at improving team performance. Uh, it, it looks at the behavioral elements, what drives people in order to act a certain way, in order to have a certain behavior, to do, to do whatever they do or to say whatever they say, um, and how can we influence this? And how can we enable people in order to um, exercise their, their own desired behavior as much as possible? And it is based on the work of uh, B.F. Skinner and also people like Aubrey Daniels who have created the whole organization behavior management movement. And then in, in Holland, we have the Free University who have adopted this as well. Now, the first step in creating a behavioral change is also the most fundamental step. It is to specify the desired behavior in your organization, in your team, or from your customers, from your colleagues, or whatsoever. And this very first step, it's, it's hard. Um, it takes a few iterations before you get to the real behavior that you want to specify. But it's so fundamental to really have this, this, this discussion that we'll talk a bit about how to specify this behavior. I won't talk about the rest of the protocol. Um, it is important. Uh, to understand this protocol, uh, but it would take quite some more time to discuss into this. Let's first dive into this one, uh, specifying behavior. And if you want to specify DevOps behavior, so if you want to peel off and not only looking at DevOps and saying, well, this is a culture, this is a mindset, and peel off, so what exactly does that look like then in real life? Uh, we have some sources that we may have, may want to look at. For instance, the Agile Manifesto, which shows some values and principles. They're still kind of vague. They're not tangible enough. Right? They say things like welcoming changing requirements. Yeah, okay, so what kind of behavior is involved there? What does that exactly look like? It's not specific enough. Same goes for the three ways, which are reflected in the Phoenix Project and the DevOps Handbook material where we talk about systems thinking, amplifying feedback loops, and having a specific culture in place. It, it's also not specific enough. And so if we really want to transform people towards new behavior, we have to be able to specify the right behavior in the right way. So this is also something that you can do with your own team. 
So what you would like to do with your own team is to have an exercise with your own team and talk to each other and say, so what kind of behavior do we actually expect from each other? If you look at this DevOps way of working, so if we want to collaborate a bit more with each other, what exactly does this look like? So what do we do? And what, what kind of things do we say then? What do we exactly really need to, uh, need to perform? And this is not only with your team, uh, an excellent exercise, uh, but also, for instance, if you're a manager, um, one of the key things you do as a manager in an organization which adopt agile DevOps type of methodologies, um, the primary question you can ask them is, what behavior do you expect from me as a manager in order for you to be successful? And if you're not able to uh, help the team specify this in the right way, it will only be stuck at, you know, we want you to be open or transparent or whatever. It will never be visible behavior. So how do you get towards visible behavior? Because if you ask a team for the first time, so what kind of behavior do you expect from your colleagues or from your managers or whatever? These are typical, you know, terms that we hear. These are terms that I hear in real life if I ask teams. If I ask teams, so what kind of behavior do you find important in order to move towards a DevOps mindset and way of working? People say proactive or we want feedback, we want value-driven, we want honesty, we want shared goals, we want customer-driven actions, and all of these things. But all of these are very, very important. They're fundamental even, but they're not behaviors. They're not something that you see someone do or hear someone say. They're not tangible enough. They're broad. And so anyone can have their own image with collaboration. And don't get me wrong, they're really important to share because they're important values, for instance, but they're not behaviors. So if we move one step deeper, how do we specify behavior? Um, well, we need to make sure that if we specify behavior, we look at behavior uh, as in what we see someone do, do or hear someone say. And first, try to avoid Vegas, which is values, generalities, attitudes, statuses. So all of the stuff we saw on the previous slide, most of them were values like honesty, openness, transparency, uh, or there were generalities like teamwork or collaboration or attitudes like value-oriented or customer-oriented. So all of these are not real active behaviors. Um, and if you're still in doubt, is this you now a real behavior that I just you know, came up with with my team? You can always do the dead man's test as well, which is if a dead man can do it, it's not behavior. So, you know, um, leaving room for the team or um, not making any errors it doesn't pass the dead man's test because also a dead man can do that. This will help you to specify behavior in the right way. And this might come up with, you know, examples like this. These are typical examples, uh, which we came up with with a number of teams, which I first identified, well, ownership, we think is very important or feel safe, we think is very important or uh, transparency is very important. But the thing is to move it, you know, a bit, a bit more detailed and to make sure that it's more tangible. So if we look at feel safe, we all find this important, but the behavior that comes with this may be that all managers openly reward the identification, prevention and resolution of errors. Or if we think improving and continuously improving is important, let's try to pinpoint a certain behavior around this where we say every severe incident is followed by a blameless postmortem where everyone is open to share ideas and opportunities for improvement now this actually creates great discussions because then you're talking about real actual behavior instead of just focusing on rough values and high level attitudes what I've seen people and teams use this in practice for is, for instance, they came up with two or three behaviors that they found most important for their team, and they just put them on the Scrum or Kanban board, and they reflected on those behaviors every retrospective. Did we show this behavior in the past sprint or not? And that is really fundamental because then you're not only creating 
behaviors like this, you're also making this a continuous discussion point right? and you're making a tangible, uh, a tangible topic for your teams. So um, finally, my lessons for this, uh, my personal lessons, what I've learned in, in, in practice would be that behavior is everyone's business. It's not something that managers are supposed to be um, uh, be dealing with. No, it's something that teams are also dealing with. And you can make it very practical. Right? You can discuss this already with your team starting tomorrow. Right? Create something like uh, a, a few behaviors that you'd like to discuss with each other. What kind of behavior do we want to see from each other or from our product owner or from our suppliers? We shouldn't stop at DevOps as a mindset or it's a culture. Right? Go a level deeper, go towards behavior really. Uh, define desired behavior with your team or teammates or with your stakeholders and you know you can already start tomorrow and of course you, it won't be perfect all at once uh, but you will have a tangible practical point to discuss on further and this will be you know the first step on your continual improvement um, journey so that's what i'd like to share with you around uh, devops and um, and and behavior and where they both you know collide I don't know if there are any questions. No, uh, fantastic, Dave. Thank you. Um, yes, we did have uh, some questions that came in during the presentation. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, read the first one right now, which is, Dave, um, how do you fix behavioral issues across organizational boundaries, uh, especially if your delivery partially depends on external suppliers? Ah. Yeah, I suppose that this is also about contracts, right? So um, if um, and, and contracts are already, always tricky um, because contracts usually reflect sort of, you know, these are things that we need to agree with each other. And these are the service levels, for instance, that we want you to achieve as a supplier. Um, what I have experienced in, in, in some, some of my assignments is that we uh, also put behavior on the agenda with the, for instance, with, uh, uh, with the discussions that we had and the periodic evaluation sessions that we had with our suppliers. So we included behavior as a discussion topic. And I've even had a few suppliers where we created you know, some real tangible agreements also with each other. So we had some sessions where we talked about behavior, what kind of behavior do you want to see from your supplier? And as a supplier, what kind of behavior do you want to see from your customer? And would it be wise to just, you know, note them down? And, and, and in our next meeting, we'll reflect on those as well. So that creates some, something like, you know, maybe even you could call them behavior level agreements, where you really make behavior tangible and a tangible discussion topic with your suppliers. Okay. And uh, the next question I have here, Dave, is uh, DevOps breaks down silos, but how do you, how can you assure that the new DevOps teams don't just form new ones? Hmm. Yeah, that's always tricky uh, because, you know, yes, DevOps is about breaking down silos, or I should say it's about connecting silos. Uh, um, and of course, you should always be warned that you do not create separate silos, horizontal silos, um, uh, as in, you know, these are teams and they're end-to-end -end and they don't talk to the other teams anymore because they're fully end-to-end -end and, you know, uh, there will always be dependencies and you want to limit dependencies as much as possible. But if you have dependencies, there are quite some good and handy, you know, either, you know, what, there are quite some frameworks you could use, but like say for less or you know, the, the whole way that we, uh, that we have seen working at Spotify, for instance. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't actually depend on a framework, uh, one more or less. Um, it generally depends on true collaboration between the teams as, as well. So identifying dependencies and just talking to people from the other teams and making sure that dependencies are dealt with in an early stage uh, if you have, you know, joint business cases you want to achieve, it will be very wise to share your, um, maybe even your code base, but also to share some of your planning sessions or your uh, retrospectives every now and then to make sure that you're not only achieving the goal for you as a team, but 
looking at you know the goal from an old value stream organization perspective. Thanks, Dave. Um, the next question we have is, do you think DevOps will still be a thing five years from now? Hmm. Yeah, I think it will. Um, maybe not on, the, on this name. So actually DevOps for me is, it's, it's not a perfect name. Um, and at the end, it doesn't really matter what you call it, right? So uh, DevOps, it signifies bringing together Dev and Ops. So people might think that just putting some developers and operators in the same room, it fixes all of our problems. Or, um, you know, having some DevOps tool or tool set being, you know, um, put, into your, put into place in your company that fixes all of our problems. It just doesn't, right? There's quite a lot of uh, things that happen around this that should be dealt with as well. But if you look at the principles around DevOps, and also particularly if you look at the why behind DevOps, so why do we think DevOps is, is a thing right now? Because it needs to address better collaboration between originally, you know, a pretty, uh, pretty distant silos. Uh, we need to connect those teams more. We need to connect roles in the organization in a better way in order to create better products in a faster way with happier customers, et cetera. As long as we keep that in mind, it really doesn't matter if we still call it, still call it DevOps in five years from now, but I'm pretty sure that what's ever behind it, uh, it, will, it will remain for more than five years even. Excellent. Uh, well, in the, uh, in the spirit of time, because we're running out, um, we need to cut the uh, presentation a little bit short. But if you ran, um, if you asked any questions here, uh, we'll make sure that those questions are forwarded on to Dave and you will receive uh, an answer through email um, later on. So uh, I think we'll just go ahead and wrap things up. Dave, thank you so much for your excellent presentation today. Very insightful um, and, and great. Um, and uh, that's uh, Dave's information uh, right there, along as uh, if you want like any additional information um, you know, regarding DevOps, Quint services, and how uh, Quint can help you, please check out our website. It's www.quintgroup.com. Um, there's uh, informational white papers that you can read, um, as well as have access to our academy portfolio if uh, DevOps training is something that you're interested in um, as well. So we'll go ahead and uh, say goodbye. Thank you for joining us today. Everyone have a great remainder of your day wherever you are around the world. Thank you.